we can start. Good morning and welcome. Uh, uh, my name is Jovan Kurvali. I am director of Diplo Foundation and head of Geneva Internet Platform. Together with me is uh, uh, Sorina Teleanu, who is director of knowledge at Diplo Foundation and person who is involved extensively in AI developments. And now, uh, while we were preparing for today's session, we thought of uh, having two ways to approach it, and we will be guided by your questions and comments about this session. We want to develop it by genuinely as, uh, as a dialogue. We have a lot to offer uh, in terms of ideas, concepts, and uh, overall approach of Diplo to, to artificial intelligence, but I'm sure that there is a lot of expertise in the room. And this is basically, basically the key. Therefore, the, let me suggest a few practicalities. We will talk, but whenever you have a question, just or comments, raise the raise the hand and don't feel be don't feel intimidated. The only stupid question is the question which is not asked. Well, there are a few exceptions of this rule, but uh, but that's basically our our approach. Therefore, you uh, you can. Uh, I always think when we gather for a meeting or for a course, because we are teaching a lot, I said, how we can really maximize on this hour? This is valuable time for all of us. We generally, we sometimes underestimate that importance of moment, importance of being there. And I think in Kyoto with Zen Buddhism and other things uh, with the Asian religious tra tra uh, traditions, we can learn more about being there, being at the moment and trying to grasp, trying to really find this unique energy. And unique because this is moment, this very second, this very second of our life and our existence and uh, our interaction. Therefore, let's maximize on that. Now, uh, Sorina, shall I monopolize the microphone or you're so, so gentle and nice? I started with philosophy and probably this is one of the possible entry points. Because artificial intelligence, for the first time, pushed us to think about the questions, why do we do it? Or questions of why for our existence, the question of our dignity, the question of purpose, the question of efficiency, many core questions that civilization has to face. Therefore, if you see the, our leaflet about the huma, uh, humanism project, you can see that we approach it through technology, through diplomacy, through governance, and through philosophy, linguistic, and art. You can get any entry point. Uh, I suggested this philosophy entry point, and you will see why it is, it is important. Now, I'm sure you will be using a lot of cameras. Unfortunately, these days we don't use this. We just brought with my wife Nikon from Europe, very heavy Nikon, and she told me in Tokyo, said, why do I need to carry this heavy Nikon with the lenses, you know? zoom out, zoom in, when the iPhone is basically, good iPhone camera is, is doing, doing a lot. Now, we won't get into this discussion. I'm sure that there will be passionate Nikonists or Canonists, you know, these two tribes, who will say, no, 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 you still do it with Nikon. But idea is to zoom in, zoom out. We zoom in on philosophy, we zoom out on questions, or zoom in on technology, or zoom out on philosophy. Therefore, try to use that optics within the next, uh, next hour. What is uniqueness of Diplo is that we, whatever we do in digital governance, since the very beginning of organization, we needed to touch technology. Therefore, we did the TCPI pr programming, we did the DNS, we did everything in order to know how it functions. We wanted to see what is under the bonnet. One problem, and uh, I'm noticing, uh, I was at the first IGF at the Working Group on Internet Governance, which is ancient history, long, long time ago. But I noticed that sometimes we discuss things without understanding it. We don't need to be techies, mind you. These issues are sometimes even philosophical, but you have to have a basic understanding what's going on and how it functions. This again, when we need to have the scale, you know, to understand technology, but not to become techies. Because then if you are uh, only techie, you are basically, uh, can you, you won't see the, the whole forest from the tree. 
everything will be just uh, neural networks these days, or yesterday crypto or blockchain or day before TCP IP and th that's then basically a problem. Therefore it's a tricky exercise. Therefore we have all of these entry points. And what I suggest, uh, which is in the, in the also in the title of the session, is also uh, there is another aspect that we should keep in mind that walk the talk approach works in a way that whole IGF will be reported by our hybrid system combining artificial intelligence and human intelligence. Therefore, if you, if you go to IGF 2023, it's Dig Watch 2023, you can uh, also download the, the iPhone or, uh, or, um, or Android uh, app, and you will be having the reports from the sessions coming by mix of artificial intelligence and human intelligence. Now, how does it work? We've been reporting from IGF for decades, summarizing long session into humanly, basically. Now we said, okay, let's codify that, our reports, and create AI system. Therefore, we can have something which could be called IGF GPT or IGF AI. But basically, we train the IGF on the on the our reporting and our sessions. Now it is now deployed by our AI team. Poor guys are uh, have to wake up early in the morning. They're based in Belgrade. They are now uh, doing uh, uh, reporting by AI system, doing everything automatically from transcribing, also special language for transcribing for IG and AI and cyber terminology summarizing transcribing and then making uh, making it into the report which you can visit here for for each each session now as you will see from the reports and you will see from our work i think this session is we have just to put that is it's a gmt time because i was confused this morning i said what two o'clock in the morning uh, you will have after the session, I don't know, about 20 minutes or half an hour, I don't know exactly what will be the timing, you will have reports from this discussion. Therefore, again, we think we have to walk the talk. It's enough to talk about AI, how important AI is, how it's changing the world, ethics, uh, AI will eat us for breakfast, uh, or uh, we may survive, we may not survive. That's another discussion which I'm very critical and skeptical about. But let's use AI and let's see, the only by using it we can see how it works and uh, how dangerous it, it is. We are not naive about dangers, there are risks. But many risks are now and here. If you just go to the risk in the future, it it's could be a bit tricky because whenever future was brought in negative way in discussions, it was often around certain ideologies. And the message is, forget it today, forget it now, we discuss future. And once we come to the bright future, we'll be happy. But what's happened in the meantime with our lives, you know, the references, I won't make uh, references to the historical experiences, but it's very tricky argument on the, on the, on the, on the future. Therefore, there is something that you can, can use, use now. But let me again zoom out and go to, uh, to basically, if I manage to close this, oh, I managed, fine, great, wow, now it's again, make to be now. <laughs> we call it that we had winter of excitement, ChatGPT came into the force, everything is changing, it can write master thesis instead of you, blog post, you know, you know the whole story, is, let's say, December, January, February, although AI is much, much older, as all of you know. Then there was a spring of metaphors. People suddenly realized, wow, it's coming, let's do something with this. It's metaphors are danger, apocalyptic, amagmedon, uh, the risk for society, or nice ones, it will help us. Then you have summer of, uh, of uh, reflections. And we call it autumn of clarity. Think about four seasons, not the hotel, but uh, four seasons in AI. Winter of excitement, spring of metaphors, summer of reflections, autumn of clarity. 
Now, during the summer of reflections, what I did, I said, okay, let's see what happened. Two things we did, Sorina and myself, and she will explain the other thing, what she did at the, at the course. We said, okay, let's do, uh, let's recycle ideas. What were the ideas of ancient Greek on axial age? What can Socrates teach us about AI and prompting? What about journey of zero from Indian civilization via al Khwarizmi to Antunis to Fibonacci? What about ancient Greek? What about uh, Chinese three big philosophers and the AI? What would these people tell us about knowledge, about ethics, about uh, individuals and communities, about the Renaissance with Voltaire and Rousseau, great thinking of Renaissance period, Holbein's painting, it's a bit of my niche interest, the Vienna thinkers, when you really think about today's era, and under this there is, a, there is a text, you can see that you have five thinkers who live in Vienna between two world wars who basically set the stage for AI in Geneva and, uh, and Vienna, and I'll show G Geneva thinkers. Hayek on knowledge, Freud about human psychology, and possibly person who inspired thinking about AI is Ludwig Wittgenstein, who basically moved to the probability theory and language as a key element of the, of the, of the philosophy. Then we said, okay, uh, those are Vienna thinkers. You have then Ubuntu thinkers in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. Again, another rich civilization and thinking not written in the texts, but basically codified in the, in the practices. And in parallel, what we did during this summer of reflection, Sorina went to deliver the course at with the College of Europe for the group of students from Germany, she wrote the blog post. Whatever we do, we codify because we believe in creative commons and enriching discussion on, in this case, AI. So you, know, you may tell us a few words how you, you, I will scroll, but what, what did you do during the, during the course uh, and what was the purpose of using AI and how did we use it? Thank you, Ivan. Hello, everyone. Uh, we won't spend more time um, talking, but just quickly, because the title of this session includes this whole idea of bottom-up AI, and we hope to hear from you what you understand by that. But what we did at the summer school is just one example of um, bottom-up AI. So quickly explaining what happened there, we had a group of 25 students, and for about 10 days, we simulated the negotiations of a global digital compact. You're at the IGF, I'm pretty sure you know what's with the whole um, GDC and the discussions around it, so I won't go into that. We split the team into, a f well, the group into a few teams, technically representing some of the biggest um, countries and groups. We had China, um, the US, Brazil, and a few others, also civil society and technical community. And the task was to prepare and then negotiate how they would see a global digital compact um, looking like. But to help them, and also because many of them were newcomers to the whole idea of um, digital governance, what our team in Belgrade, Serbia, um, did was to prepare this AI advisor. How it worked, we fed it with a lot of documents on internet governance and digital policy, and also with the contributions that stakeholders made to the global digital compact process. And then each of these five teams had their own advisor. What you see on the screen is the advisor of Brazil, right? The idea was for, st for students to engage with the AI, to see how it works, to use it in the process of them preparing their arguments for negotiation, but also to discover the bad of the technology or the challenges. And that I found the most beautiful part of it all. At the end, we sat a bit and talked about how they actually used the advisor, what they found useful and what they found challenging, and the discussion was really good. They were able to say, okay, we used it to fine tune our language, um, to be better at negotiation, uh, negotiating for our position, to find things we might not know about our own country or our own stakeholder group. But we also understood that we cannot just rely on what the AI is telling us, but take it critically, assess it, and actually um, use our minds. Another reason why we did this is, as you probably know, some of the um, schools around the world have taken this very, very knee-jerk reaction saying, okay, we're going to ban the use of artificial intelligence in schools. 
which we think is not um, a good approach to take. So the idea at the, sum, at the summer school was to expose students to the use of AI for them to be able to develop this critical thinking as to how you can use it, why it's good, and where you shouldn't actually rely on it, because again, it's just the technology and sometimes it does um, hallucinate. But this was just an example of a bottom-up AI and how we're trying to build this um, from the bottom. And I think we can turn to the audience, Jovan, and ask what everyone here actually understands by bottom-up AI before we actually go into more of what we're doing. So I'm going to move around. That. Do we have a roving mic or? Ah, there is a mic there, right? Um, a question to you all in the room, because we promised we're going to have more of a discussion and not the two of us speaking for 90 minutes, which kind of defeats the whole purpose. What do you understand by bottom-up AI? Or if that doesn't sound like an interesting question, why did you join this session? What did you expect from it? Please. Is it before or after coffee? <laughs> no. Thank you so much. I, the reason I'm here is because I want to know what you think of it. <laughs> help us, help us come wrestle the idea to the ground and we'll probably help you back. Thank you. The AI, chat GPT won't reply in this way, you know, <laughs> therefore it is really smart. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, but uh, try to be in, uh, as, we, as we move to the next, next step. Basically, Sorina explained practical use on the critical issue when universities worldwide are banning use of AI, ChatGPT. They tried with anti-plagiarism software, it doesn't work. OpenAI stopped using uh, anti-plagiarism software, therefore this is not an option. Therefore, our message and it was successfully accepted. There are some anecdotes how some professors reacted to it, but we won't, we won't, all the, we won't mention the names, but uh, academic community reacted, no, we are, uh, we are in charge. Forget AI, we said no, AI can be interlocutor, can sharpen your thinking, as Sorina proven practically, St and students, l students love that because it can sharpen your thinking. Then we comment on the questions that AI ask uh, provided, answers that provided, and say this is good, this is stupid, this works well, this works good. Therefore, that element is critical. Now, it is going to change educational system profoundly. We are on the similar generation, let's put in this way, depending on the educational traditions, but there was a lot of learning by heart. There was a lot of listening to the ex cathedra professors in my educational sort of process. And a few professors who basically acted like chat GPT in my end question and answer then provide me stupid answers, stupid questions, are still people whom I can remember. Therefore, that element of conversation, AI can help us. And our argument is that don't kill the messengers, don't put your head in the, in the sand. Let's see how AI can help us achieving critical elements of any educational system. It is improving critical thinking, it is improving uh, creativity, and it can do. Therefore, our argument, and we can substantiate it practically, whatever we are mentioning today can be substantiated practically, is that AI can be a great help for the real education. I'm sorry, not for the Bologna style, taking the uh, assignments and number of the credits and this and that. That's another story we can discuss. But for, I would say, the ancient uh, Greek or Roman education about inquiry, creativity, questioning, and consider yourself as a dignified thinker who can, who can engage in the, in the thinking process. Now, uh, let me, let me, uh, this is for example about Ubuntu ethos on these philosophical issues where you can find really powerful thinking from Africa on the, that can uh, enhance artificial intelligence and uh, basically should be codified especially if we, if the companies or hopefully African actors deploy AI in their context. And this is the first building block for bottom-up AI which was the title of the session. We have to codify local uh, traditions, practices, ideas that deal with questions of family, the question of universal individual creativity, knowledge, happiness, 
and whatever we ask ChatGPT today or even more advanced system in the future. It, is, it cannot be designed only by European philosophical uh, and thinking tradition. This is the first point on genuine bottom-up AI. The second important aspect which we have been doing in, at, uh, at uh, Diplo, and I have so many windows open, I will hope that uh, is to develop, I'm sorry, to, uh, okay. We argue that there are few two points of relevance for bottom-up AI. First, it is ethically desirable because it let us preserve our knowledge. It's not anymore just about data. It's about our knowledge. This is what defines us as individuals, as a humans, as a civilization, as a culture, as a family. And we're speaking about ultimately critical discussion for the future of our society and each of us individually. And what we did, we basically said, okay, what can we do? And first we went for open source. And as you can see, there is a very critical discussion about big systems bringing the fear and danger as a risk for society, mainly by a few big companies, OpenAI, Google less, uh, few companies, you know, usual uh, Sam Altman and these people who are touring the Congress and places all over the world, uh, uh, which is a bit paradoxical situation. They created something and s telling us, hey, guys, it's very dangerous. I said, okay, but stop investing in it if it is too dangerous. O of course, there is a bottom-up competition argument, but there is something strange on a very logical level on these this, this things. And most of them, are very nervous about open source AI. Except, who I, if somebody told me that he would become my, one of my heroes, I would be very uh, surprised, Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg created Meta, created Llama, and they made it for their own reasons. Competition with Microsoft, with Google, and other, other actors. But Llama is doing quite uh, well. Uh, uh, and there are developments like Falcon in the United Arab Emirates. There are now developments with quite a powerful model, which brings things to the relatively simple issue. And we can now discuss it. It, it is not that much innovation. Neural networks, they were innovation when they were introduced. But now you need basically a lot of hardware and a lot of to be friends with N uh, NVIDIA and uh, basically to have a processing GPUs and uh, a lot of hardware to process. If you can invest in that, you can train uh, big models. That's another issue which makes, makes me personally nervous. Uh, it's forget garage, forget bottom up in that scenario. Except for time being there are pushbacks, and it will be dynamics in this way. Therefore, the first element is open source approach. The second is you need high quality data. And that will be an interesting story because most of these companies more or less process the trillions of, uh, I don't know, whatever, books. I got a bit lost when it comes to this n number, over the billion, but trillion something. And now they come to the point that they cannot get any more high quality data. Therefore, they are doing a sort of called annotators or data labeling, uh, mainly, uh, you know, this Kenya study, Kenya case with open AI, it's, uh, there was the strike of people who were working on open, open AI data, but basically they sit next to, next to each other and they're basically annotating, say, for this is a bird, this is a cat, or this text is useful, this text is bad, and the other things. And I will show you how we do it at, at Diplo as sort of a annotation. But this is, I would say, the key diagram because quantity of data is limited by definition. You know, there is this idea of AI creating data itself, but I'm not sure that it will go too far. And you have the quantity, quality of data. Therefore, quality of data will be critical. And then even with the small data, if you have high quality, you can create AI. That's basically 
what what is going to happen in the in the in the coming and coming years and this is the reason why companies are very nervous they are rushing to get into quality of data to can to 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 get it in order to to capture that future future competition now what we do in uh, you can read the blog post but what we do we have a system which basically annotates any text therefore when sorina and i read the text we annotate the text and we are our teaching system is based on annotations therefore by teaching by doing research we are creating high quality data therefore it's integrated in the work and i will show you practically how how it works okay for example this is the uh, for example, for example, uh, you are following uh, obviously developments in Middle East. You are on Al Jazeera, and uh, you are um, you are reading the text, and you will say, uh, "I'm not now. I'm just inventing the the argument." You will basically, I will use the highlight. Let me see if I'm if I'm in the Google. You will use highlight. It, you know how it works. It's usually all often does not work when when it's needed. Hmm? When you try to show it, I to public. Okay. Okay. Or you can open. Ah, you annotate and you. I write in annotator. Sorina. What do you think about this? argument Sorina will answer this in this case is public she will answer this she will re uh, receive the 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 annotator and two of us are adding the a new layer on the thinking of uh, of uh, of the text on Al Jazeera now we have because we have been using this as a teaching method for the last 20 years. Those of you who are from Diplo alumni, they know that we were being basically, I designed this method as based on metaphor that I like to highlight the text and write, write something in annotations on the side or have a sticker. We developed this system 20 years ago, but this is now the critical system of adding the layers of the quality on the text. Now, when AI comes and see this text, ChatGPT will just process it. But in our case, if there is discussion, we say, aha, this paragraph is important. Sorina, uh, Jovan asks Sorina. Sorina asks, answered. And then Sorina and I are developing our, basically, our very local bilateral AI built around knowledge graphs. Therefore, we can then share it with the rest of the humanity or keep it for ourselves or share with Diplo or share with you share with the others. Therefore, our idea is that we can bring AI back to individuals and then develop big systems. Ultimately, why should I send it to the big system where I can do it, we can keep it for ourselves and then share as a, our human right, our right of citizens of society with the rest of society. Therefore, this is the, this is the key concept behind the uh, AI now has it triggered some ideas for questions or comments how does it work practicalities anything else it's a bit intimidating where you have to stand and to walk uh, next to Mike but if you you can shout also I'm fine for the for any any question or comment so far so far no therefore this is the basic idea return let us preserve our knowledge. Why this knowledge that Sorina and I will create around discussion? She can comment then on the what's going on today in in uh, Israel and Palestine. Why should we share it with somebody else? Why we don't uh, preserve and then share as our knowledge? It can become much more complex when you annotate complex texts, philosophical books, other other texts. This belongs to us. Then we, in Diplo, we share it. You see, it's public. We share it because we think uh, everything should be Creative Commons. 
but we are very nervous if we, because of technical facilities, have to contribute it to OpenAI or to Google or to Baidu, whoever is basically providing this, this system. Therefore, what happened with Google 10 years ago or Facebook and others when they basically commodify our data and our sort of use of internet is now becoming, is starting on much higher level with, with knowledge. And that's basically idea to bottom up. One thing is that we talk, and I explained to you, maybe some people even got interested into this. The other question is if we can prove it in practice. And this is different. If you have a system that can prove in the practice that it can work. And that's basically what we have been doing with the, with the bottom up AI, returning AI back to people uh, uh, with all their strengths and weaknesses. Serena? Uh, maybe we give one more close to a practical example of how this could be implemented. We're having these discussions in Geneva. One of our, yeah, a part of our work is to support the engagement of small and developing countries in digital governance, digital diplomacy, and all these big organizations in Geneva, but also beyond. And we're interacting a lot with missions in Geneva, and we hear a lot, especially from the smaller one, how they cannot follow everything and anything because, well, there's a lot. And also how sometimes they don't have enough time to research what they have done before to actually come up with a position to present that at some um, organization or some negotiation. So in discussions with them about this whole this, uh, idea of bottom-up AI and how we can or cannot use um, technology, this idea also came up. Like can a Ministry of Foreign Affairs develop its own AI system to use for their own purpose instead of you know putting data into um, ChatGPT or Bard or whatever else and actually rely on the wealth of um, knowledge they have developed over the years? And the simple answer is yes. And should they do it? Again, the simple answer would be yes, because you don't give your data to a bigger system out there and you don't rely on all other information that might be coming from different sources, but you rely on what your Ministry of Foreign Affairs has um, developed over the years, policy papers, document, and whatever else. And again, the question would um, come obviously here as well, can you rely completely only on AI to come up with a position that your uh, diplomat will negotiate in an um, intergovernmental process? No but you can use it as a starting point to save time because you don't have that much time to actually come up with something. So if you have a starting point and then you bring your own expertise and your own abilities, that would help. So this would be one example of how we see uh, bottom-up AI happening and helping in this um, specific example, smaller countries. And here is, we may just display it again if you, if you don't mind, here is the conclusion from the last week discussion on, well, 10 days on the General Assembly. We processed all statements delivered, you know, President Biden, uh, heads of states were basically saying what do they want to do, what are their views on different issues, from climate change, the Ukraine war, digital, and we, okay, we asked the question, what did they say about uh, digital? And we processed that and we got to the, to the report, which is a very interesting report. You say, let's say, on artificial intelligence. Line by line, relevance, what Barbados said, what Ethiopia, what India, what Malta, what Andorra, what Somalia, in the bullet points, what they, what they said. And then you have uh, also in-depth uh, in -depth report with the statements what uh, each country basically, uh, what is the transcript of the session and what is the summary, let's say on Albania, uh, you can see how many, how many words, the speech length, what is knowledge graph? I mentioned already knowledge graph is critical. You can do knowledge graph on anything. We'll be having knowledge graphs about of all sessions and the IGF. This is a proximity of thinking. Could we have uh, Sorina and myself knowledge graph about today's session? What were stances of what Albania was arguing it? What are the arguments? What is the speech itself? What is the summary of the of the session that uh, was hosted by 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 Albania? And then what was interesting, we ask also uh, AI based on all statements. If you put all knowledge in the General Assembly, or in IGF, we'll do s similar thing with the IGF. You ask the question, and uh, you ask the question, 
what should we do to combine uh, action on climate change, change and gender. I hope they're not testing the system because now they're shifting to, let's see, I hope it will work sometimes. Okay, they, the system gives the question, the answer, based on the all speeches delivered in, uh, now we won't read it, but that's basically what is what is delivered. And, or what was the, when there was a session in, in Security Council, we did the same thing, and then each session, you know how is with the multi-stakeholder advisory group, you have at the beginning of the session, you have the uh, key question, and then the answers, but also on based on what parts of the speeches AI generated the text. Unlike ChatGPT, which will give you just the basically answer, we said no, we want to ask AI to tell us what parts, for example, this answer was generated on part of speeches of the professor from King's College, mainly mainly his, his speech, but some other answer was the generated, uh, okay, this is Malta speech, or you can go through basically 360 questions that are based on transcript and generated around the idea of uh, what is the climate change answer, the question Bangladesh, Nepal, Slovakia. And you suddenly realize that Bangladesh and Slovakia have something close when it comes to the discussion question is about climate change and digital commerce. Therefore, you basically discover completely different event. And this will happen with IGF. Maybe we'll have, oh, at the session on AI, there was somebody else discussing bottom-up AI, which I'm not aware of. Maybe not calling bottom-up AI, maybe calling organic AI or something like this. And you suddenly say, aha, here is a knowledge graph between Jovan, Sorina, and John, and Pietro, and Mohammed, and the other sessions. I said, okay, I didn't know that we are doing the same thing. And that's basically, I'm just giving you very concrete uh, examples. What Surina said, small states got really excited about it. Because you say, Djibouti had three diplomats in Geneva. They don't have a chance to follow the all sessions in Geneva on health, on migration, human rights. But if they have this system, they say they will receive alert. Hey, by the way, Djibouti, at the working group, 70 hundred, you know how many working groups, at the ITU or WHO, there was discussion of relevance for your maritime security. They are very, because they are big port, they're interested in maritime security. By the way, follow that discussion. Therefore, suddenly you have equalizing aspect of AI that it brings uh, small states that they can take care of their uh, sort of interest, specific interest. There, were, there we just highlighted a few options and probably we'll close uh, with this. We started with philosophy. This is ultimately philosophical issue, but give you a few concrete applications in education, in diplomacy, in IGF itself. You can follow IGF itself and it would be interesting to, to hear your reflections on the quality of the report on the, on the, on the ideas uh, around it. And then, about this practicalities, how it can improve, let's say, inclusion in global governance for small countries, small organizations to follow what's going on on their interest. The ultimate message is, let's return AI to citizens, let's make it bottom up, uh, let's build around it, and let's find practical uses. It's enough of the big talks about ethics and AI. Here are practical uses. And last point, which is important, it was part of the title of the session. As we are discussing, let's preserve human imperfection. Because we cannot compete with machine. We should sometimes, people were critical about my title of this session, that we should let AI hallucinate as we sometimes hallucinate. And if you think about the major breakthroughs in the history of humanity, 
that are usually related to the time when some people had a chance to be lazy. And, uh, and in ancient Greece, in, let's say, British Empire time when all sports were invented from soccer to tennis uh, to all major sports because these people had, had a lot of time. Others were working for them. I won't go into that. But if we can basically leave a bit of uh, imperfection, and there is one blog post which I cannot find about need for human imperfection, we should facilitate that. We won't win the battle with machine on optimization. This is not possible. But we should preserve spaces for imperfection, for being lazy, for having time to reflect, for developing arts, for making mistakes. And this is the reason why I went to the uh, flea market in, in Belgrade to uh, search for the new Turing test. Basically, flea market traders, as you know, they're, they're masters of human psychology. And I said uh, they're completely imperfect, all, always on the edge of the criminal milieu and the other, the other things. And uh, I was going through the, criminal, uh, through, the, through the market and asked one of the traders, who is not, who is legitimate, I asked him, okay, uh, uh, tell me what do you In think search for ultimate limits of uh, artificial intelligence with colleague of mine, Mishko. We've been trying to see if AI can replace experienced trader at the flea market. Approaching a seller on a flea market can be a great way to find unique items at a reasonable price, but it's important to be aware of the potential risks of being ripped off. Pre nego što stigneš do njih, oni te već procenjuju, rade procenu kako si obučen. Kada priđeš onda na osnovu priče, zaključuju koliko imaš para, da li si iskusan, da li nisi. Najbolje je da ostaviš utisak na njega da nemaš previše para i da nisi previše iskusan. It's usually best to avoid revealing too much about your level of experience. Jer ako pokušavaš da ostaviš utisak previše iskusnog, onda kod njega se javlja taj, kako što kažem, ne strah, nego vrevo, ti onda neće ti popustiti sa cenom. Znači ide blaga naivnost? Blaga naivnost. Don't be confrontational or aggressive, as this can put the seller on the defensive and make negotiations more difficult. Nisi siguran zašto ti to eventualno treba. Approach negotiations with confidence and a clear idea of what you're looking for. Ostavljaš utisak, čak i ako ti treba, ti onda, znaš ono, kao, dobro, idem još jedan krug. Well, I got confused. Trader Mishko and AI gave us very similar answers. But, and big but. AI can explain what to do. However, AI cannot act yet as a flea market trader. For time being, flea markets remain a refuge for human uniqueness. That, that was one of the, uh, in my uh, search for human imperfection, I, I go to the flea markets and other places and see what are going to be our niche. Because we cannot compete with machines. We cannot, they will be always more optimized than us. But we have a right and we have, a, I would say, duty to preserve the core uh, humanity uh, which has been passed to us from previous generations in all cultures, from Ubuntu to Zen to Shintoism to, to basically uh, ancient Hinduism, to Christianity, to ancient Greece. Al al underlying element is that humans are in charge. And that is basically which one thought which I would like to leave you with, that uh, in this battle we will be having a tough time, but we can do it and we show it practical how it can be done with bottom-up AI. I'm s getting some sign, but my human imperfection is... Uh, no, I'm looking at the room. I'm hoping now we can have a bit of a dialogue. So please, questions, comments, uh, your own thoughts about 
your interactions with AI, how we preserve our humanity in all this, um, how we build bottom-up AI, how we rely on it for whatever your work is. Yes, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Emanuela. I'm from Brazil, and I represent Instituto Alana, which is an organization that is focused on defending children's rights on, uh, on the internet, on the environment, and focused on social justice as well. I have a few questions for you. Uh, one thing that I thought that was really interesting about the diplomatic view and the advocacy view is that these two that you guys presented, like this approach, could be really good for advocacy organizations because they have like you have like a knowledge management system approach that I think that could be very helpful and contextual. But how that my, I think my question is very practical, like how to incorporate this when considering that, especially in Brazil, I see that a lot of NGOs and organizations they are not very tech. So you, you said about open source. I will I want to know like the practical side. How can we benefit from this kind of technology? I have a second question that another issue that we face is considering how to increase voices and increase participation and in such a big world, but like how can we increase participation on these matters about tech? And do you think that this approach of bottom up could be something that could be used to organize different participation approaches from different places and you know categorize knowledge in a way that could be sensitive to local perspectives but with more you know, data analysis, so this is my second question. And the last question, sorry, but just to you know, fill up the you debate. You compensate for others being twice, so. Sorry? You compensate for others being twice. <laughs> and one thing that worries me a, a lot is about the structural unemployment that we are seeing in the service sector. Like this is a sector that employs a lot of people in Brazil. So, and we see the increase of usage of chatbot and automation. So I was wondering, what are the economic perspectives of bottom-up AI that you are presenting? How can we move like economic opportunities for people that are rewarding, that, you know, that signify, uh, yeah, dignity? Because we see a lot of unemployment and we don't see a lot of, uh, anyway, I think you guys understood like the, the basic approach. Thank you a lot. Thank you for excellent questions. Uh, well, all inspiring, let's probably start with the third one. This is exactly what I mentioned when I said, instead of discussing what will may happen with AI generative, uh, um, uh, artificial generic intelligence basically killing us, uh, which you can hear from some Altman and these gurus, there are things that are happening now. People are losing jobs. And there is a risk that whole generation, if I can use the slang, could be basically thrown under the bus. Not only b any more blue colors jobs, but white color jobs. Lawyers, accountants, I would say many of us in this room. Uh, that's a big, big problem. And how to deal with this now and here. I hope that IGF, we can report in the, with AI, basically what will IGF say about that, but it's a huge problem. Our ar argument and strong argument is that job is not about only about universal income. It's a question of dignity. It's a question of realization of your potentials. It cannot be reduced of, oh, you will get the money at the end of the day and go, go fishing or go whatever you want to do, what makes you happy. No, this is job has been throughout the civilization the way of realizing our potential and appreciating our core human dignity. Now, it's a big issue. This is why this is a social contract discussion of utmost relevance. And for example, Ubuntu civilization, African traditions are interesting. You are because I am. And there are different ways of seeing it, not just optimization, optimization, optimization. I don't have an answer, but I would say that should be on the top of the agenda or whoever discusses uh, policy and the, and the other issues. Do we need always to optimize? In some cases, we may step back. It will be counterintuitive. It would be difficult to promote, but we should introduce this right, human right to be imperfect. We have that right because it defines us as humans. Therefore, that's the, the Surina, if you want to add anything on that. No, no, no. Shall we take the other two questions? So we had the other one on how bottom-up AI might be able to help better representation from the underserved communities, I guess. 
Um, I guess there are multiple ways. First of all, as Jovan was saying earlier, making sure that we do use um, knowledge from these communities when developing these AI systems. And then as we were giving the examples of small missions or um, this kind of yeah, smaller entities, that would be a way to help them better represent it in the discussion. But what I didn't understand from your question was whether you're talking about representation in governance discussion or representation in the development of AI. Then the example we were giving with uh, following the reporting, for instance, from the UNGA, which would then be able to alert the smaller countries, okay, this is something that might be of interest for you. This is a country that you might want to build an alliance with. So in this way, um, it can help foster more meaningful engagement well, while or where um, these countries cannot follow everything and anything. And then the other example we were giving, how it can help build the position to get to that meaningful uh, engagement. And then what we usually say that if you're not uh, at the table, you're on the menu, then AI in these examples can help avoid that very unpleasant um, situation, especially with the smaller countries that don't afford to follow everything because of limited um, resources. So we do see these uses, and it's not only us. Again, it's countries seeing um, it themselves. We have had quite a few of discussions in Geneva with um, smaller missions. What just Sorina said, I think what applies to small countries, let's say in Geneva, applies to small NGOs or civil society coming from Brazil, I guess, or any other country. You don't have a hu human uh, resources. I mean, Diplo delegation, delegation in this place is three of us in the room and uh, Anastasia will come. You know, comparing to other delegations, uh, it's uh, basically a statistical mistake. But we will contribute to public good by this reporting. And now practically what can be done, and it's the most important, we are starting the project where we'll try to push some of ideas on civil society supported by European Union and engagement in inclusion of civil society. You basically, how would it work? Your organization deals with jobs or? Child rights. Child rights, okay. You will make your map and say knowledge graph based on your documents, based on your Zoom meetings, whatever you want to put it. It will be your knowledge, knowledge graph. You will just apply it on the whole, whole uh, analysis of IGF. And you will say, aha, uh -huh, here is the similar problem that people face in Uganda or in uh, Romania or in, uh, uh, whatever place. Therefore, suddenly, out of the transcript, you will say, you will get and you will say hints how to how to do it, or how to frame discussion next time for the next IGF to be more persuasive. Because you realize that this argument in child uh, protection didn't fly at the, this IGF. People just brush it and say mm, that's not next question. You know how it works, but somebody's uh, rhetorical approach made a wonder that we get a really deep insights into this and you what is beautiful through the process you develop ai because by commenting on what work what didn't work you have reinforced learning and your system is every on every stage stronger and stronger therefore in two or three igfs even with delegation of two people you can have impact of organization of 200 sometimes. Because you, you know what, uh, what is your focus, you, you know what are your strengths, what sessions you will follow, and what, 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 what you will do practically. Uh, well that's that's uh, powerful. Now, how to do it? Uh, the best way is, uh, Pavlina, my colleague, and uh, can brief you on um, later on, or you can exchange details about this project that is uh, starting in January, which will have one of the elements, how to use AI to enhance basically participation of the local communities and, uh, and the other actors. And what Sorina said, by developing your knowledge graph, you will take specificities of Brazil and it will be element which won't be generic uh, child safety or child rights which is developed by big system. No, it will be specific to Brazil or even local communities. I don't know. Rio, I don't know Brazil very well, but specific problems that exist in communities. Therefore, well, from the problem of future work of jobs, which is big issue, to what Serena explained about developing system, to practicalities, contact Pavlina and we can, you can join the, some activities or project. I think we have a partner from Brazil as well. 
and that, that quadrant can be saved practically. And it's very important that we are practical on AI, otherwise discussion will be too theoretical. I, let's see if you inspire some other questions or comments. Critical ones, challenges that we need to, to we have some, or you're just playing with your hair, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. No questions, everything is clear. Or extremely ah. confusing. Or extremely confusing, you know. I'm, I'm just wondering what you're learning about the bigger systems. So that are there th ways in which you are giving them feedback or ways in which you are noticing sort of systemic problems that really ought to be addressed in the models themselves? Well, bigger, bigger systems uh, are big, uh, and they're big not only in the number of the data they process or money they attract, but also they basically don't listen to small guys like us. They have important things to finish to go to U.S. Congress or EU Parliament or Chinese, whatever place they discuss this issue, or uh, therefore there is a bit of arrogance element of hubris, I would say which could be dangerous because it's not only their business, it's also our business about our future and our knowledge. Uh, we found it uh, a bit, uh, uh, you know, in any technology you have magic. I still remember when I first was using a, a, a mobile phone, it was a magic. Technology is a bit magical. That's internet and the other things. For us, we are now typing, but when you think there is element of magic. Now, AI brings magic on steroids. And some Altman can go, I'm mentioning him very often because I'm very critical about uh, this use, and say, oh, guys, uh, AI will uh, eat us for breakfast. I'm using this, uh, this sort of, I said, okay, but why, how, when? Uh, give us something, we cannot uh, trust you just uh, on th these words. I mean, uh, you have to, and first, you, you let's discuss jobs today. Let's discuss disinformation. Let's discuss a uh, destroyment of the public spaces, uh, online spaces with the uh, AI contributes to it. It's not only AI. Uh, we found that problematic discussion and especially uh, non-explainability or partial explainability of neural networks adds to the magic. We put something, AI does something, and you get something. This is why, why we insist always to have the source of the answer of the question. Yes, here is a source. And this is the first step. We don't know how AI got this answer, but we know, and ChatGPT can know that, and Bard and Baidu and the others, they can know what were the sources for that answer. This is already the first step. Therefore, we see a lot of a lack of transparency confusion, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid to say that it will be fertile ground for the conspiracy theories. Because when you are just saying, uh, well, trust us, we want to regulate you, and, uh, and uh, don't ask questions, just trust what we are telling you, uh, and then uh, you basically, for me personally, I have a problem with that. I don't think that things cannot be explained, at least source of your conclusion. I know neural network is not easy to, to explain technically. I have a colleague who is into AI and he said, listen, be careful when you go to these IGFs of the UN. If you, if you introduce explainability of neural networks, half of us will be in the jail. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, okay, that's, there are realistic, uh, realistic concerns, but there are things that can be done. That's my sort of criticism of uh, big, big systems. And to add on that a bit, if I may just reinforce uh, one of your points, in all the discussions about AI governance, you've probably followed Sam Altman and a few of the other big guys saying, yes, it's a huge mess that we've created, well, they don't really say we've created, but um, AI is coming with all these challenges and it's going to break the world and destroy us and this and that, and we need to regulate. But if you look carefully at this discussion on we need to regulate, what they're saying is we need to regulate future AI, not the AI yeah. we as big companies have developed, but future AI. So let us do our things, we'll continue doing the best, and you should worry about the future. And I think that's problematic, and I think we should hold them more to account to what's happening right now. As Yvonne was saying, we have problems right now with AI that we should be solving before 
looking at the future. Not saying we shouldn't worry about the future and what might happen, but maybe put more resources into what's happening right now and how we address today's um, challenges. And that would be it. Um, I'm looking for one presentation, which we may share later, later on, where we are basically, ah, here it is. Uh, that's, uh, I was recently in Brussels, obviously, they're preparing the new, new regulation, and we said, okay, uh, let's see wha what does it mean to regulate AI. You uh, regulate hardware, you regulate data, you regulate uh, algorithms, and you, uh, you're the first to see it publicly. We didn't show because they, there was some problem with PowerPoint uh, during that session. And we regulate apps. What does it mean practically? What do you regulate? For example, as Serena said, the, you can't hear some Altman saying regulate apps, or even data. Why they are not showing sources? Obviously, if you find a book which is copyrighted uh, as a source, there will be a problem. As you know, there are already court cases in the United States against, against open AI. Uh, or hardware computing power, where things are happening with the NVIDIA and the GPUs. Where, what do you regulate? Read carefully next time when you hear, listen to Sam Altman, you can't find the, except, oh, regulate AI capabilities. What does it mean? Basically, we created these capabilities let us stop the other developments and basically, I'm now a bit cynical, let's have monopoly on this. I said, no, that's against competitive market. It's against creativity, it's against other issues. But there are problems that we have to deal with. How apps can be misused, how people can be thrown out of the jobs, uh, how uh, this information can be generated. You know, you know the whole story, it's a part of public public discussion, but where do we regulate? You can't hear companies talking about data. That's non-existent. They are already concentrated on this blue one, which is basically vague. They avoid apps, red one, because this is very concrete, you know. And hardware, it's more geopolitical discussion these days between US, China, and uh, these big players who is going to have hardware capability to process data. We'll be publishing soon article on this to bring of clarity. When I started winter of excitement, spring of metaphors, summer of reflections, autumn of clarity. There could be disagreements, but let us not misuse the magic of technology of AI. Magic is important. It can inspire, but let's not misuse it. Let's basically keep the magic of technology while discussing governance issues where they are. That's it. Looking yeah. again at the room. It's always this, this sort of uh, tension in the air. We want questions. No, we, we don't want to force you to, <laughs> to ask the questions. Uh, what, uh, we have 10 minutes more? No, we have 25 more 25 minutes. minutes. Okay, let's lis listen, let's chat in the corridors if there are no other questions and or comments. Oh, okay, you have, have, oh, uh, you have two questions on this side. Okay. I hope it is not forced question because we are uh, asking for the questions, no? No, no, no go ahead, go no, ahead. No, it's, uh, I was thinking, sorry. And you are? Introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Julia, I am a youth from Brazil. I am with my delegation here. And I was thinking when you were talking about Ubuntu and od other societal aspects uh, of the philosophy behind AI or what could be the philosophy behind AI. And I, I'm think I g got me wondering if there is any initiative to use AI as a uh, as a means to preserve and to develop uh, small communities, history, and culture, and uh, have them not be lost into the translation that we are be we are ex experiencing of uh, losing uh, practical and physical. Uh, knowledge and ways of tr sharing knowledge, like uh, 
families are being uh, uh, estranged by the recent modern uh, changes that they are moving too much they are being displaced by like technology and opportunities job opportunities and so on how is there an uh, initiative or a uh, or a group or an entity uh, towards preserving small cultures or uh, at least uh, not small cultures but uh, having uh, having uh, trying to bring access to small uh, cities or small communities to try and update and upload their knowledge and their, their um, basically their knowledge, I'll step their knowledge, but we can also imagine that uh, a knowledge of uh, villages of small cities can comprehend into uh, uh, physical practices, agricultural practices and stories and mythology and so on uh, because I have a personal um, I, I, that, that, that's also a personal question for me because I think about how we are we losing I'm from Brazil how much we're we losing from uh, being uh, away from the, the, the countryside and having uh, the cities expand and the countryside shrink although the countryside is the majority of our land mass. G great, I think it's an excellent, excellent uh, question. Uh, the short answer is yes. And, uh, and I'll give you, but g let me give you an example of Diplo. It's always, I always try to start with, uh, with myself. Uh, we are a small organization. We have our, let's say, we are a small community somewhere in Amazonia where we basically live in the, the river and we had a culture and we had to deal with the questions that every human has to deal with, the question of family, love, purpose of life, what do you do after you die, what do you do with your uh, kids, and these things. This is a knowledge, this is a very valuable knowledge, maybe not codified in the books, of big philosophers, but this is core knowledge. Can it be saved? Yes. Should it be saved? Yes. Uh, are there initiative to save it? No. Why, d why is it the case? I can't tell you, but it's very sad because we are losing on this diversity of humanity and I don't think that you there is a hierarchy of knowledge and experience. Maybe money and power is not equally distributed, but human capability to innovate is distributed. And that's basically uh, how, how it can be done. Now, is there initiative? No. Can it be done with open source tools? Yes. Is it easy to do technically? Yes, organizationally? No. Because you have to change the habits and you have to change the quite a few things, but not undoable. Is there interest to support it? No. Uh, well, you will hear here many inclusion, cultural diversity, <coughs> this, but when it comes to concrete things, there, there is no action. And I think countries like Brazil should push, especially the new government, I think it's keen on the diversity, should push organization like uh, UNESCO to do something, to preserve the knowledge uh, by using AI. And that, what is your name? Julia. It could be Julia's initiative. We have a question from a uh, from colleague here. Could you just, well, the process is that you have to stand next to the mic. Please. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Nicodemus Nyakundi. I'm from Kenya. Uh, I've come under the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. Uh, I work in Kicktonet uh, under digital accessibility more specifically for personal disabilities. So there's something that has been disturbing my mind and I really need to understand when it comes to AI. More so that uh, AI has not deviated so much from the normal approach towards machines and computers like how it is based on inputs and output models. So we have AI that is mostly trained on perfect data. I call it perfect because it is a predetermined data 
and data that, that is considered to be normal. But we, have, we want that AI to work with the imperfect human, a human who makes errors. So uh, also we have to recognize the good thing is that we make mistakes, but then as humans, we resolve back to correct the mistakes. So my question is, what approach should we take to ensure that the AI is as human as us, and that uh, it can work with persons with disabilities, and uh, ensure that they also contribute to basic life needs for persons with disabilities, so that uh, it does not create more of a marginalization because it will come into with the interface of, say, defining another form of perfect, of which not all of us are. Thank you. Serena? Let me unpack the few issues. One about people with disabilities. AI offers possibilities, serious possibilities. We are seeing it with transcribing with the other issues with people with disabilities. Again, people with disabilities are not prominent uh, uh, yet in AI debates. And uh, here again, small communities could ask actors like UN to check their disability quality, how people with disabilities can access. We recently have some study and we are going to do to check diplomatic websites how disability friendly they are. And that's, I would say, that push has to be strong from the, from the bottom up communities and other, and other actors. This, uh, this is the first question. Should we make AI look like us? That's a philosophical issue, and I'm, uh, I'm um, not sure. I would preserve AI as a tool in the mindset. It will be a powerful tool, but always a tool, which Sorina used during the co course this summer to enhance learning. To have it always as a good tool, as a good, uh, not to have it as a master, but to have it as our servant. That's very important mentally. That will be a powerful servant, which may revolt and which may uh, say, okay, I want to have uh, some power o over it, but that's basically, I would, I would keep it. Obviously, we'll try to mimic, it excites us. If you read the Frankenstein from the Mary Shelley, this is the best uh, example. Basically, she, Dr. Frankenstein, wanted to create a perfect creature. And that creature, if you can recall the book, uh, was created to be good. And then uh, it went out of the lab and people were afraid and people became aggressive. And then creature reacted and started be get nasty basically. How we now perceive Dr. Frankenstein. This is where I'm for example very uneasy with anthropomorphizing AI, putting it as a humans. Because it is exciting, you can have a nice event uh, uh, people are excited, oh, Sophia, what is the name of all of these robots? Fortunately, I don't see any Sophia in the, at the IGF. Uh, oh, Sophia can answer your question, and they said, no. What we do, we have a coffee machine as AI. It, uh, it, was, it had the first session, for those of you who were in, in IGF Berlin, 2019, it was participant in one session. You can search IGF coffee machine. That's that's element which we have to be very careful. Otherwise, we will finish like a uh, creature of Dr. Frankenstein because th we will think that uh, that creature is creating us some problems. But I here made one suggestion. If the IGF uh, gives you a chance to be a bit imperfect, and I, I share it here on the screen, you can go to the philosopher's path here in uh, Kyoto. I heard it's a nice walk. Uh, run away, be a bit imperfect, don't, don't be at all sessions, except thank you for coming for our session. But here is the leading Japanese philosopher uh, who basically studied, who used to have a walk through this philosopher path, and you can see that he was reflecting on society, on purpose, on happiness, on other issues. I don't know if you are going to have somebody from philosophy department at Kyoto University, which was one of the best in, in uh, Japan, but that would be an interesting, interesting, interesting discussion. Back to tradition of Ubuntu coming from Kenya. Okay, it's more towards south, but all that tradition of 
of us belonging to collectivity and being the part of being empowered by collective, by family, by by our surrounding. That's that's the answer to the to the practical again answer. The if the weather will be nicer, go to the. We don't have a cherry blossom. Uh, that was I will criticize AI organizers why it is not in April or. Or the but we can get back to, to to Kyoto for this. But philosophers path is an interesting place where these guys walking like uh, Kant used to walk in uh, now the Kaliningrad. It was uh, um, uh, at that time uh, Prussian city. You know the famous uh, Immanuel Kant. He was walking every day same route. He was only late one day, and uh, that's mystery in f you know pettiness of philosophical discussion. Why he was late. But I forgot the name of this uh, a, a Japanese philosopher. Uh, oh, Nishikida Kitaro is basically the best Chinese philosopher. I plan to read more carefully and see what we can learn from him about AI and uh, basically develop this discussion uh, further. And my call for imperfection, w try to discover this lovely city. You will have anyway Diplos reporting that you can read what was happening, but uh, that's that. Should they be official at this point? No. I will get in trouble with the secretariat uh, and um, the, these things. And thank you for coming. Uh, let's, um, let's walk the talk and enjoy the corridors and chats and uh, basically continue this interesting debate uh, about bottom-up AI and our right to be humanly imperfect. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Serena.